Welcome to episode 191 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman. Today we are talking about enterprise software and how do you build an enterprise software startup. We talk with founders, we talk with VCs and entrepreneurs, and everybody wants to build for the enterprise. Sell to CIOs and sell to lines of business across a company. But it's really, really hard to do. And our guest, Abhinash Tripathi, who is the CEO and founder of HelpShift, which is a startup that has managed to cross that chasm and is successfully working with very large organizations. And so we're going to talk about enterprise software. As always, there's a tweet chat going on simultaneous with this live conversation. And so join us using the hashtag CXOTalk, and you can ask your questions of Abhinath, and you can join the conversation. So Abhinash Tripathi, how are you? Great. Thank you, Michael, for having me on the show. Well, it's awesome you're going to be here. And you're the CEO and founder of HelpShift. So let's begin by give us a brief background about HelpShift. Great. Um, HelpShift is an in-app customer service product. We uh, built this product because we saw something that was changing in the environment. Uh, consumers are using apps. Uh, employees in organizations or companies are using apps and apps are becoming sort of the uh, mainstay in this mobile uh, era. And what we observed is that, uh, you know, the user behavior is changing as well, that people don't want to be on the phone or email someone for customer service, but they want to engage in messaging like uh, behavior, which is uh, sort of uh, very uh, attuned to the mobile centric world we live in. And so we brought that paradigm into the app uh, environment and started working with very, very large brands like Microsoft and Supercell, uh, who are all leaders in sort of the mobile space and uh, delivered the first sort of mobile in-app customer service experience. Um, and uh, we have lots of customers now who enjoy the product every day. So tell us about the company in terms of how long have you been established? how much money you've raised. So give us some of the vital stats about that. Yeah, great. So we've been around since mid 2012. We raised our first money uh, in the middle of 2012. We didn't even have a product. We had a very small team of uh, about 10 people. And uh, we built the product, launched the pro uh, product in the market in 2013, middle of 2013. And then uh, we've been selling uh, the product since then. And now we're basically a series, post Series B stage company. We've got 120 uh, employees worldwide, um, and uh, we've got lots of customers. And uh, it's it's a great great uh, uh, feeling to be part of a company that's really making an impact. Abhinash, as as I said during the introduction, it seems like almost every startup these days wants to be an enterprise software company. And it's really not an easy thing to do. So can you summarize for us some of the challenges? Why is it so hard to sell successfully to the enterprise? And then as we have this discussion, we'll talk about some of the ways of overcoming those challenges and some of the lessons and the things you've done and the lessons that, that you've learned. Sure. Um, so, you know, I've been part of the Valley sort of start, startup ecosystem for a while now. And uh, you see this sort of cycle where, you know, the companies that want to be B2C companies for a while and B2C is cool. And then there's a bunch of like a slump in the valley and uh, with B2C valuations and you see startups gravitating towards uh, sort of enterprise. And I think we're going through that right now. And a lot of companies believe that they want to be enterprise companies or sell to the enterprise uh, as the focus now is on, on making money and being profitable. Uh, but having said that, I think enterprise companies uh, or enterprise startups that cater to enterprises, very different type of startup, right? So take our startup as an example. Um, we really focused on the very large customers from day one. Uh, it's, it's painful to, to, to be in that because uh, in that kind of space, because it takes a while to build a company. 
Uh, it takes a while to close these deals with large sort of companies. They have a lot of process. They, they do a lot of diligence. They want to make sure that uh, you as a company can and meet their needs and you're there, there for the long term because they're making a sort of a long term bet. Um, so the sales cycles are very long and you have to be very prepared to deal with co companies like that and with longer sales cycles. And then once you start uh, building up your uh, pool of referenceable customers, then your uh, company starts to accelerate from a growth standpoint uh, because a lot of the bigger companies or the bigger enterprises, the way they do business is they look at uh, who in their peer group you have on your logo board. So that's kind of important. And uh, so as you build a lot of social proof that you are uh, working with a bunch of enterprise class companies, then uh, the, the sales cycles get shorter and your growth starts to accelerate. You say that you built the company from the ground up thinking about the enterprise market. What did that involve? Um, I think if you really look at sort of the enterprise market uh, and, and ask yourself as to what's so unique about the enterprise market, I think the first thing is we will all agree that enterprise is a definition that we give to companies that have attained certain scale. So scale is a very, very important aspect of doing business with them. Uh, so for example, when we started selling to our first customer, uh, it was in the gaming vertical. And in the mobile space, gaming had the most scale. So some of the customers we work with uh, have in excess of hundreds of millions of daily active users. Um, and some of our largest customers in the gaming space uh, generate about you know, 40 to 50,000 customer uh, conversations or tickets or chats or whatever you want to call them. Uh, every day, and they they service those number of chats with about you know uh, two thousand agents uh, sitting in contact centers around the world, and so that sort of scale is uh, is something that smaller startups uh, don't have to deal with day one because a lot of the enterprise focused or or what I would say B two B startups focus on sort of the long tail day one, and they don't have to work on these scale challenges. Uh, they're usually working with companies that have five to 10 employees, 100 contacts a day, and they build a solution uh, towards that market. And then uh, they can't really go and address the scale needs of larger enterprises. So scale is a very important aspect of enterprise software. Uh, the second one is really uh, being very flexible when it comes to working on some requirements that may be very enterprise uh, integration or compliance oriented requirements. So when you work with large enterprises, you know, they may have their own internal systems that, uh, that you need to integrate with that are not standard off the shelf, you know, or Valley uh, standard sort of, uh, you know, stack of software. Uh, so you need to have great APIs, you need to have the flexibility to work with uh, those companies to build sort of, uh, you know, integrations into their systems. Um, and I also feel like uh, the compliance requirements are very, uh, th those could be daunting to a, to a startup trying to work with enterprises, right? So for example, if you're working with uh, financial services, then uh, you know, PCI compliance becomes really important. If you're working with the healthcare vertical, HIPAA becomes important. Uh, we were working in the gaming sector uh, originally and for us, COPA was very, employ uh, very important. Um, you know, COPA is a law that basically uh, says that, uh, that it, it establishes the rules for, for service providers about collecting uh, information from children uh, who play games or whatever. And so we had to implement a lot of these uh, sort of compliance uh, compliances in our, in our product uh, very early in our life cycle to deal with verticals like gaming. Um, so that's, that's another aspect of being flexible and uh, being able to understand so the needs of the enterprise and responding to it. Mm -hmm. So as you're starting, when you were starting the company, how did you, how did you get to the point where these large companies would take you seriously? Because you're providing in-app help. So, so in other words, a company like Microsoft, for example, or a large gaming company has an app, a mobile app, and you're providing the help infrastructure, so to speak, that allows users to interact and chat with, the, with, with that company to get, to get customer service. 
And that's pretty mission critical for, for those companies. So how did you get to the point where they were willing to trust you with that set of jewels? Obviously it doesn't happen overnight, but so when you were at, yeah. the, at the early stages, how did you get to that? How did you reach that point? Yeah, I think uh, the key here is differentiation. So if we went and created a product that was just a better customer service platform, uh, and it was sort of the red ocean, what uh, you know, Phil Black, one of our investors likes to call it, the red ocean. So let's say we were just marginally better than any of the customer service products out there, then we would have had a much bigger challenge convincing these large uh, companies that they have to try this. Uh, but what we did was we had this, we were the first in market with this in-app native mobile sort of customer service experience that was modeled around chat. Nobody else did it. And we were able to convince uh, large companies that this was a hugely differentiated service that their customers would really enjoy. So our first large, you know, uh, gaming customer, which is Supercell, you know, they had, you know, the traditional sort of uh, very modern help desk uh, that's available that most of the companies in the Valley use. And then they basically uh, saw the differentiation. They saw how much better their customers' lives would be to do it all in-app, inside the app, inside the game. Uh, prior to this, the old customer service product that they were using, the user experience was very, very poor. Basically, the users had to leave the game. They had to go online on a mobile phone uh, to a mobile uh, to a website that wasn't even op optimized for mobile. Uh, search for FAQs there, uh, fire off an email ticket, and then come back to the game. So there was a lot of friction, and we got rid of all of that friction and showed Supercell that you know you could just a user could just press one button inside the game and have access to customer service and uh, natively just like a mobile app on uh, on their phone. And uh, and that really uh, got them thinking. They gave us the opportunity to trial our uh, service inside one of their newer games because they're not willing to risk uh, changing their workflows. They had a team that was about you know a few hundred people at that point and they were not willing to change, uh, change the system unless they were convinced that the value was not marginal. It was, it was a huge step forward. And so that first pilot that we did with them was, uh, you know, proved that the experience was so much better, users loved it. So they made the decision uh, to switch their entire support offering. In fact, they were probably one of our boldest sort of customers because they went out and turned off email as a channel, turned off every other channel that they had and just you know, basically made in-app customer service sort of the primary channel for all the users. But how did you get them, how did you get them to trust you? Is, I think trust is the key factor here. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I mean, the Supercell is a very, very interesting company. Uh, they're one of the largest gaming companies. Uh, you know, you've read all about them in the press. They make billions of dollars every year from their four mobile games. Uh, at the point where they started working with us, they were already sort of a billion dollar revenue stream kind of company and they were unwilling to risk or take big risks. Uh, but because the experience we showed them was so powerful, we, we actually, so the way it all started is that our sales, one of my sales co-founders or co-founder that had sales uh, basically, you know, nagged them for a demo, finally got to meet them at some sort of event presented sort of the experience and they were sort of intrigued. And then a few months later, their uh, CFO, sorry, COO, who was uh, flying down from Finland, basically uh, emailed us saying, hey, I'm going to be in San Francisco. I'm going to stop by your office. Uh, uh, let's, let's talk. And so we, we were very excited. Uh, he came down to our office and we sort of explained uh, our company and culture and how we build products and and he was very intrigued and, and uh, he said, okay, I'm going to give you an opportunity in one of our newer games without disrupting what we already have. And if you're able to prove uh, in that game that, that you're able to perform and meet our expectations, uh, solve all the pain we're having with our current um, solution provider, then we will adopt you in all our games. And so that, that pilot ran for about three months. Once the pilot was done, basically the results were on the table for the company to make a very educated decision. 
and they decided to unplug their their uh, traditional sort of CRM and move over entirely to to help shift them. And it's been and that customer has scaled all the way from a few hundred agents to a few thousand agents, handling you know in excess of forty to fifty thousand contacts per day. Uh, when I say contacts, or real tickets or chats per day. And a lot of our larger customers have that sort of scale. Um, and you know, once you you close a big customer like that in the gaming vertical, like Supercell, it it basically draws a lot of attention to you from their peers. Everybody wanted to be Supercell uh, in the gaming vertical, and so they were curious as to who we were. Uh, and we have our branding prominently in the SDK that we provide. So when people open up a Supercell game and go. Uh, to help, they can actually see Powered by HelpShift. And a lot of people noticed that and they called us and wanted to learn as to why we were better and how we were able to help a company like Supercell. And that, that sort of drove um, adoption in the gaming vertical. And so the first set of customers or early adopters of HelpShift were mostly gaming customers. And, and really that made a lot of sense to us because if you look at the app ecosystem, the market we were going after, um, you know, 80 to 90% of the revenue in that ecosystem is generated by gaming companies. And just being dominate, dominant player there uh, was, was, was awesome because we got to work with sort of thought leaders of the mobile space. The gaming industry is by far one of the most advanced uh, when it comes to mobile. And we took all of those learnings, put it into the product, and now we can go after non-gaming uh, verticals. We have customers in in, in uh, e-commerce vertical like Target, we have customers in the productivity space like Microsoft, uh, we have publishing customers like Flipboard, and uh, we have media companies like Virgin Media, we have uh, IoT companies like Honeywell and uh, Sunto as customers, uh, WordPress. So uh, basically we've gone beyond gaming, uh, but I would say the initial part of our life was mostly gaming. Gaming had a lot of scale, it, it taught us a lot about how to work with companies that have a lot of scale, um, and which is very important to the enterprise. And then we started to work with companies like Zynga, for example, who uh, were using another traditional CRM system and moved over entirely to HelpShift. And they had a lot of custom sort of API kind of needs. They had integrations into a lot of their systems, uh, backend mm -hmm. systems. And that's where we learned with Zynga, we learned how to do a lot of integrations into their sort of uh, backend systems and developed APIs. So we met some more sort of enterprise uh, needs there. And then mm -hmm. we already had started working on COPA and things for compliance. Right. And, and so I think the, the focus we had from day one to go after large enterprises gives you the opportunity. Actually, it's hard, right. but it gives you the opportunity to go specialize. And when you specialize, it really shows. And so then... Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So from the beginning, you specialized in the gaming industry. Somebody made an introduction. One of your, your investors, I think you said, made an introduction and they, they sort of tentatively adopted you. It worked. You grew it from there. Then you had basically an anchor foothold, so to speak, in the gaming industry. And from there, you were able to expand out. Now, during that early period, as you were going through that expansion, as they were trying you out, what kind of pressures or tensions did it create or challenges did it create inside help shift? Because at that point, you know, you've signed them up for a trial or a proof of concept and you have to deliver and then it only gets bigger. So what kind of tensions, challenges, pressures did it create inside help shift at that time? I'm glad. I'm glad you asked this question because the when we signed on Supercell, we had absolutely no idea who we were taking on. These were the largest game. This was the largest gaming company in terms of active users, uh, probably the 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 toughest of the toughest to deal with. And having that as your and having them as your first customer, uh, literally, if you if you could not respond to a customer like that, could be a company killing event, right? And but we were. We didn't shy away from it. We we took on that scale. It was incredibly hard. I still remember uh, when we first brought on. So so they were very satisfied with how we worked in their small sort of uh, new game, right? And the new game did not have a lot of scale. It was the new game, 
And then they had this giant game called Clash of Clan, which basically has, you know, hundreds of millions of da daily active users. And while we knew of the scale uh, and we, you know, we, we knew about it, um, our systems were probably not ready for that level of scale yet. And um, when they first brought on Clash of Clan, on, when, when, when we launched with Clash of Clan, um, literally our, our, our servers um, you know, were going down um, because we couldn't handle the load. And I remember spending uh, 20, 20 days and nights with my engineers in the trenches, sort of you know, keeping the systems up, re-architecting on the fly, adding capacity, um, we had to re, you know, redo a bunch of our uh, software to meet that sort of scale. I mean, it's called refactor in 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 the uh, in the uh, sort of geek speak. We had to refactor a lot of code to make it work at that scale. And you know, I, I remember having a couple of conversations with the COO of, of Supercell, where he was like, "Hey, are you guys sure you guys can meet our our sort of uh, volume?" And I had to convince him that we had it and we would have it and in a couple of weeks, basically, we would be past all of that and uh, we would just keep scaling. And lo and behold, two weeks later, our software kept scaling. We handle sort of billions of events every day on our on our stack. So, uh, uh, you know, basically today we're handling in excess of three to four billion transactions per day on our servers. And thanks to Supercell, we were able to do that and they gave us the opportunity. They were willing to be patient. They gave us a little bit of time we were able to respond in that time. And then once they, once we proved to them that we're able to solve these really hard problems, we really became, uh, you know, very uh, deep partners with them. Um, and that partnership, the way it were, I mean, this is another sort of lesson of working with large enterprise customers. Um, so we have weekly calls with sort of Supercell's uh, team. Uh, they have thousands of agents who use our system. So obviously they're the most demanding customer we have. Um, we don't put them through the normal support process uh, of, uh, you know, of raising issues or tickets with our company. Uh, our product managers talk directly with Supercell on a weekly basis. We take inputs from them on what's working, what's not working directly, feed that into product and uh, respond very quickly. Um, you know, and we have quarterly business reviews with them. They come to our location once or twice a year. We go to Finland once or twice a year. Uh, we work on joint roadmaps, and so it's very different from working with very small enterprises, uh, where you know in the SMB space, a lot of these service providers don't even meet their customers or even have phone calls with them. They just email them or Slack them, and 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 that's about the contact they have. But when you work with these large sort of enterprise customers, you really are true partners, and you work in a very very partnership oriented sort of mm -hmm. mode. What about the uh, the sales cycle? So, for example, you know, selling. <clears throat> excuse me. So it sounds like the sales cycle initially for Supercell, which was your first really big company, was pretty straightforward because you had that that introduction. But for a startup having to deal with RFPs and RFQs and traveling with teams of people to meet deciding decision committees uh, that very often large companies have in place. It's, and, the, and the sales cycle can be very long, can be six, three months, six months, nine months, can be a year. As a startup, how did you manage that aspect of it? Well, I mean, if you're, if you're selling to the enterprise and you're consciously uh, building a company to sell to the enterprise, all of the, those things are a given. You have to do, the, do those things to be able to sell to an enterprise. Uh, including the long sales cycles, right? So fortunately for me, I started my career in 1995 uh, in Silicon Valley working for Oracle, uh, which is where I learned my early days was all about how do you sell to very, very large enterprises. Um, and from there, I went into extreme sort of enterprise selling, which is uh, I was part of a startup that invented WAP uh, and we put mobile browsers uh, in, in mobile phones back in, you know, in the, in the days when you had those feature phones, the flip phones. And uh, we used to work with telcos, which was extreme level of enterprise sales, right? So selling to a large enterprise is one level of complexity and selling to a telco is sort of the next level of complexity. And uh, so, you know, having done that for many years, um, you know, I think it's important to 
have that experience. If you don't have that experience in the Valley and you're trying to build an enterprise company, you always not, I mean, you, you won't see the value of working with these companies, being patient, uh, you know, and investing upfront to go work with companies of that size, right? And you'll always go after what's easy. And so you see a lot of the B2B companies in the Valley, um, you know, they do what's easy. They're, they go after smaller companies, you know, five, 10 person companies that don't have a lot of complex uh, requirements, you know, and build for them. And then they find that it's really, really hard to move upstream and go sell to the enterprise. Um, you know, there's a reason why Salesforce is Salesforce and Zendesk is Zendesk. Uh, they're two different size companies uh, from a revenue and size standpoint. Um, and they probably have equal number of customers, right? But uh, the revenue difference is uh, five to 10 X, right? In how much revenue they make. Uh, because one sells to very, very large enterprises, the other one sells to, to sort of, uh, you know, the long tail. What is the advice that you have to other startups who want to sell to the enter enterprise, but they look at these long sales cycles? Uh, in many cases, even getting introductions is hard, but even once, once they have an introduction, just the long sales cycle and the patience, the need to invest, is very, very difficult because it's just so, that delay, that time that's required is so expensive for a startup and it's cash that they don't necessarily have and time that they don't necessarily have. Yeah, so, uh, you know, for companies that sell to the enterprise, the scale is, uh, the scaling or the growth is slower than selling to the SMB initially, right? So, you know, let's say you take two companies, one selling to the SMB, one selling to enterprise class companies, and they start their journey at the same time, chances are the SMB focused company will scale much faster than an enterprise focused kind of company in the initial years, right? Um, and so after the three or four year mark, it looked like the SMB company is ahead. But then once that market starts to peak, uh, peak out or, or you know, bottom out, uh, it happens rapidly in those sort of SMB sort of segments where you've run out of all the SMB accounts you can sell to and then you have to make this decision to go up market. Uh, and at that time, your product is nowhere close to being up market. And then it's literally a company. I haven't seen any sort of SMB focused company become a successful uh, enterprise company. Uh, I, I haven't seen any examples of that. Uh, nor have I seen examples uh, in the reverse where you see enterprise focused companies being really good at selling to SMB, right? I think they're two separate markets. They have two separate sort of needs or requirements and different types of companies uh, will cater to do those sort of segments. Um, that's, that's really, so the biggest thing coming back to your question, which is, you know, what, what do you really need to do to be an enterprise class company? The first thing you need to do is you need to know that you're building a long company or a long-term company, and which means you need to go find patient, uh, basically you need to go find patient investors, right? Investors who have the patience to build a longer term enterprise class company uh, and are not looking for that SMB sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, fast growth uh, kind of model, right? So there are those, the, the investors, it, it starts with picking the right investor. There in the Valley, there are, there are those investors that really want the rocket ship B2C style, you know, no sales kind of companies. Uh, you know, they basically tell a founder, oh, you should not have any salespeople at all. It should all be like inbound marketing, right? And so there's investors that, that, that prefer that. And then there are investors that believe that, uh, no, you should start working with large enterprises. Uh, it's gonna be slower, um, you know, build an outbound team. Um, and, and, the, and the two types of companies are very different. So if you look at sort of SMB focused companies, you're investing a lot of dollars in marketing, in digital marketing. Uh, and not as much in sales. And you look at enterprise-focused companies, less dollars in marketing, more dollars in sort of BDR, SDR, uh, outbound, inbound, uh, you know, uh, having account wraps and inside sales, uh, very different sort of models, right? Uh, the other thing I would like to add is if you think about how we grew as a company, uh, before we built out our uh, sales uh, and uh, BDR, SDR sort of machinery, the first thing we invested in was customer support and customer success. Because when you work with enterprise customers, uh, they are big brands and you don't want to fail there. And so you want to have, make sure 
you've got the best customer support system, uh, customer success teams in place to handle these big accounts um, and make them successful. So they become case studies. They go around uh, to the world telling them how well, how good you are as a solution provider. Uh, and, and then companies in their class come in uh, inbound. And when that engine starts to work, it's very powerful. So the, so the focus then requires patience. And you said you begin with having a customer success team. And I'm assuming at the very beginning of the company, everybody is focused there. But, but quickly, you, it sounds like you kind of specialized in having that customer success team in order to make sure that the enterprise customers that you were selling to were just delighted with everything that they were getting from, from HelpShift. Yes, so I think initially when we started uh, the founders and uh, actually I just wanted to correct you, uh, Supercell, we didn't win because uh, our investors made an introduction, we just won because our head of sales co-founder was extremely uh, sort of uh, persistent and he was a true hustler that went and literally stalked Supercell at events and somehow got a meeting with some of their people. Uh, so it was pure hustle that, that basically uh, got a Supercell as a customer. Um, and after that, it was a lot of just keeping those customers really happy and engaged and that happened. So before we built out the success team, you know, the product team, which was headed by me and the engineers, we made sure that Supercell was a massive success. And then as we brought on bigger customers in that scale, we, we built out our support and success organization first before we started building out our SDR, BDR, AE teams. That's really interesting. So you say you got your, uh, your first big customer purely on the basis of intense hustle, and then you made sure that they were really happy. That's right. So what about building up inside the company? What kinds of people did you have to hire? What was the, what was the background of, of folks that you brought into HelpShift as you were now growing in, in this enterprise domain? Yeah, so if you really think about uh, the kind of people we need, we needed customer success people, we needed uh, uh, a lot of SDR, BDR, AEs who have done this before at other SaaS companies. So uh, when we hire in San Francisco into our sales and marketing team and customer success teams, we really go look for people that have had very relevant sort of, uh, you know, uh, selling or customer success experience in, in peer group companies. So when I say peer group companies, we don't, we would typically hire somebody who's left either Box or Salesforce than somebody who's worked at Zendesk, right? Because uh, you deal with a different class of customers when, when you come from sort of peer group companies. So, so a lot of our initial people uh, are people who left Salesforce and, uh, you know, or Box or those types of companies. When you, um, as you were going through, again, this sales process, I'm so focused on the sales process because it's really what everybody cares about. How much of your selling back then and, and say today where you have these very large customers well established, how much of it is based on referrals and relationships in terms of how you get do your business development today? Well, I would say a lot of it. Uh, if you look at sort of people who work in big companies, uh, you know, they move around uh, every year or two years. And, and when they have a positive experience with a vendor, they take that to their new workplace. They talk to their friends in peer companies. So a lot of, uh, you know, uh, our customers today are, are referrals from existing sort of customers, uh, you know, and also the bigger companies, they go through an RFP process. In the RFP process, you typically have to provide references of companies uh, that are at similar scale or similar size, and uh, uh, these references are, you know, uh, are are critical to closing these deals. And so, when you start building up a, a base of these types of customers, um, you know, I would say referral uh, selling is very, very important. Uh, reference selling is very important. And, uh, and that's, it, it works well for a company that's, that's in the enterprise category. Now today, um, Microsoft is one of your customers and 
you provide the in-app, the, the chat or customer service inside important, very important Microsoft apps. So can you tell us what are you doing with Microsoft? How did you get that relationship going? And frankly, why did Microsoft decide to go with you rather than develop it, develop the capability in-house, which I mean, they could do that if they wanted to. Oh yeah, excellent question, Michael. Um, so Microsoft is, I mean, after Satya, it's, it's one of those companies that, that I think is uh, just on a great trajectory, right? They're just, they just such a, have such a great head on their shoulder. Um, and, and they're willing to look past you know, what they have in, internal, what they've built internally. They, they're just willing to do the right thing for the customer. But you know, the, our story of Microsoft goes as follows. So uh, one of my, uh, uh, so we started working with this small company called Accompli, which basically got acquired by Microsoft and is now Microsoft Outlook. And one of the co-founders of Accompli, the, the, the technical co-founder, Kevin Hendrickson, uh, was a colleague of mine in my previous startup uh, at Zimbra and at OpenWave. And uh, so you know, I started working with Kevin uh, when, when he first, you know, put the Accompli product out um, and he was very uh, farsighted and he said, look, email, even though we're an email client, I see the value of doing this in-app. I really want uh, to be able to iterate and, and build our product really fast in collaboration with our customers when they were really small. And so I, I see this whole in-app thing as a very powerful thing. And he adopted HelpShift uh, and put it in the Accompli app. It truly helped Accompli succeed, and which eventually led to their uh, acquisition by Microsoft and, and then becoming sort of the Outlook client on mobile uh, because they were really able to take advantage of the in-app chat capabilities and iterate on their products very fast. So they would put out a build uh, every two weeks. In that two weeks, they've basically taken inputs from all of their customers, optimized their app, put it out into the app store, and they really built a science around this. And Microsoft, uh, when, when they got acquired by Microsoft and it became Outlook, um, there was obviously pressure from Microsoft to abandon a third party product like HelpShift and move to an internal product, right? And so a lot of uh, you know, products inside of Microsoft were already using uh, existing products that Microsoft had, which were products that Microsoft had built. Uh, it's not even products that were third party products. So Microsoft owns another customer experience uh, company called Patature, uh, which they bought for a lot of money. And Patature was being used by a lot of the product groups inside of Microsoft. Um, and, uh, but Kevin basically was able to convince the Microsoft peers that look, in-app is where it's at. Patature was not in-app. Patature was still gonna drive customers into email as a channel. Uh, and then all of the, so more than in-app, I think the thing that we really solved for Accompli was that because we're embedded inside an app, we're able to take all of the information about the user inside an app and pass it seamlessly uh, to the cloud that the company can then have a view into. And we call that telemetry, right? So that telemetry was so vital to provide a great customer experience to the users that, that basically uh, Kevin was able to convince all of his peers that um, you know, that this was the way to go. In fact, Microsoft then became an investor. So they participated in our series B round, uh, which closed earlier this year. And they are an investor in the company as well as uh, a customer. And uh, we've moved our, we expanded our relationship beyond just the Outlook uh, mobile client. We've built desktop SDKs now that work on Windows and Mac. And now HelpShift is going to be the in-app service provider uh, for their desktop applications, for desktop Outlook, for desktop Office. So we're working on a path with Microsoft to get HelpShift embedded in almost all of their sort of desktop and mobile product lines. Um, and so that's just, I mean, I'm just so fortunate to have, uh, you know, colleagues or friends like Kevin who had the foresight, who had the sort of uh, ability to go and prove to the world that, that you know, uh, the better solution has to win and convinced Microsoft internally that the uh, that that HelpShift is indeed a better solution. So with Microsoft, you say you're working on embedding HelpShift technology, customer service technology, 
within Microsoft desktop apps like, like Office. That's right, yeah. So we're working on a path right now to basically embed help shift in the desktop apps. That is, obviously that is, that's incredible. That's just, uh, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. really, that's. Yeah. And, 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 and you have to think about the fact that Microsoft has two very large CRM products. One is Dynamics and the other is Padature uh, in-house and uh, yet they use uh, help shift. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So, okay, so now you've got this kind of relationship going with Microsoft. What does that mean internally at HelpShift in terms of how you organize the company? Because so, so you obviously had a product that was a great product, great technology, and you somehow got it into their hands through a combination of relationships and hustle and they bought it and they and then you did all the things that were necessary to keep them happy to keep that huge enterprise customer happy but now you've got to organize the company internally inside help shift uh, in terms of the right type of um, customer relationships and support for those relationships and management of those relationships and so how do you do that? How do you organize for the deep enterprise relationship? Yeah, it, it's very hard, right? So um, especially when you're in a startup environment and you're working with a lot of young people uh, on the engineering side who haven't really had a lot of enterprise experience, um, when they get asked to do things that, that are you know, uh, unreasonable for some reason, right? So the, like, you know, Microsoft, for example, uh, to work with them, uh, one of the first uh, requirements we had was that all of our infrastructure was hosted on, on Amazon. And, you know, Microsoft basically said, if you want this massive contract from us, you're gonna ho have to host at least the Microsoft tenant on Azure. And so we had to go push our team internally uh, and basically have two deployments. So we have an AWS deployment uh, for, for most of our customers. And then we have a Azure deployment that we manage. Uh, and so there's, there's all these things you have to do that are, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are things around security, there's things around privacy, there's things around, you know, uh, data storage, right? And there's so many compliance things you have to do with enterprises. And it's very frustrating to young engineers to be able to, to, to not work on cool features, but to go work on these boring sort of, you know, compliance kind of things. And so you really have to go and have a massive, um, you know, selling inside your organization to your teams uh, to explain the value of working with these large customers and to do things that may seem boring on the surface, but have huge payoffs in the long run. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an example, the work we did uh, with Azure, uh, uh, you know, is it's incredible. So we've what we so initially as a company as a startup, you're like, oh. AWS is like incredible. And we always looked at Azure as this thing that was kind of new and may not be as good. And what we learned in our experience of deploying on Azure is that Azure was pretty good, was, was as good as Amazon. And uh, maybe we'll get better cost efficiencies with Azure. And now we're starting to put a plan together on trying to move most of our infrastructure to Azure, right? So uh, there's a lot of learnings that come out of working with large enterprises and uh, you just have to be open, flexible. Um, mm -hmm. and the, biggest, the biggest challenge really is getting your team completely aligned with the enterprise focus, right? right? So getting all your young engineers to see the value of working with these big companies on, on things that may not be very yeah. cool. But, you know, that's the thing. In, in the Valley, a lot of the engineering younger companies just want to work on the next cool thing. And uh, for enterprises, you know, you have to go solve really hard problems that may not be cool, right? And that earns you the right to go do business with all of these companies. So we have just a couple of minutes left. We're just about out of time. But we have an interesting question from Twitter from Arsalan Khan. And maybe you can answer this very, very briefly. Uh, so Arsalan Khan asks, when, when you were starting out or when an enterprise software company is starting out, how good or useful is social media to help create that initial buzz or maybe even to establish relationships that will lead you to, to customers? So very, very quickly. 
Uh, social media is kind of important, but not, not, not super important. I think for B2C and for sort of long tail focused companies, social media is more important than for enterprise focused companies. And the last thing that I want to ask you, and again, pretty quickly, because we're just about out of time, out of all of this, what is your advice, your best advice for other startup founders who are wanting to sell to the enterprise and they're, they're at an early stage? What's your advice on how to get to the point that you have reached with HelpShift? Yeah, um, I think my biggest advice is if you don't have a co-founder that has worked in the enterprise category or space, uh, either selling or uh, yeah, selling or in BD, uh, then go get one. Uh, you need a person that really understands what it takes to work with enterprise companies. Uh, that's the first and foremost requirement. Uh, the second one is to go find patient money. Uh, so if you're gonna build a long-term enterprise company, you really want to get funded by a VC that is patient, that knows what you're going to be doing and that it's going to take some time and, and is willing to work with you uh, uh, and help build the company. Uh, you know, and, and so patient money is really important. So I think those two things, if you've, if you've got people that have some of the experience that you need for, for enterprise and if you have patient capital, then I think you're on your way. Right? The rest of the problems can be overcome. It's just, you know, uh, it's, it's just having those two things. Those are the sort of the foundational elements. So enterprise experience and patient investors who understand what the enterprise sales cycle and process is like. Correct. Fantastic. Well, this has gone by very quickly. We have been talking with Abhinash Tripathi, who is the CEO and founder of Help shift, and he has been explaining what it's like and what are the challenges and the solutions for building an enterprise software company, enterprise software startup. Abhinash Tripathi, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Michael. And everybody, thank you for watching CXO Talk, episode number 191, and we will see you again next week. Bye bye.